we will be having a live demo, so please cross fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so what is new about the in, in the upcoming GovNet 5? So um, my presentation will be because of two parts. The first part, the first part, I'll flip through the, the API changes and new features in GovNet 5, and in the second part, there will be demos and and then some some discussions. So what is so, so special about uh, Omnet 5? That it's a, it's a major version. So across minor <coughs> regions, we don't want to change things. We don't want to break existing models and so on. But since it's a new major version, we can we can uh, take this opportunity to introduce to introduce changes that are breaking model compatibility <coughs> in order to make things better. So. In the first, thing, first part, there will be I will be talking about the API changes. So before, we got a lot of requests about a more flexible logging API. Uh, in particular, people are missing uh, log levels. Now we have a more, in the new logging API, we have seven log levels. Uh, and uh, three referring to exceptional or error conditions. Two of them, uh, oops. Two of them are referring to, to logging for uh, model details, uh, protocol details, and two of them referring to implementation. So uh, we have also added uh, another feature, category support, which is orthogonal to the previous one. And uh, here you can see some, some examples how you can use it. Normal, normal EV is a synonym for EV info, and we have trace, warning, <coughs> error, and the others. And if you want to log with category, then you include it like this. Okay, it's also more configurable, so you can have uh, uh, filtering by log level, also compile time logable and, and uh, runtime logable, and also filtering by modules and then categories. And the implementation is also more flexible, so you can define a log prefix, and in the log prefix you can display a lot of, lot of things. And they are, uh, the dispersion sign syntax, and there are about 40 different things that are available. So you can print out the, the simulation time, even number, module name, module class, everything basically, a lot of things. <coughs> okay, random barrier generation. So now there is a way to encapsulate a random number stream into a C object. And the, the class is called C random. So everything that it's been a function so far, it has been encapsulated. So in addition to the functions uniform, exponential, and normal, you can also use them as objects. And also see statistics, <coughs> which means if you're collecting, if you're filling a statistic object, for example, histogram, you can generate random numbers uh, from the distribution that is stored in the, in the statistic object. Okay, this necessitated some, some changes. So before, we had this this signature for for nor, for random number generating functions, and this a module index, which is implicit in most cases. Most people probably don't know it, it was there. Uh, it arrived here the first part as a uh, random number generator pointer, and this way the, these functions are now independent from the from the module that contains them. But uh, we don't want to break uh, unnecessarily the models. So we took these functions and added them as the members of C component. So C module and C channel will also inherit them. So most mo mo models will not notice any change. They will compile without change. Okay, we did a, another change which, is, which was long pending. Uh, events have been traditionally represented as C message objects. Uh, in many other simulators, and it also uh, uh, some new features, uh, events are actually pieces of code packaged up as an object, lambda code. So now the, um, the message, C message, subclass is from C event, and basically the execute method of a C message says that, okay, the module should process this message. And um, this allows us to implement an end simulation uh, within uh, using a, a C event, so it's a cleaner implementation, and also cleans up some anomalies. And it's 
and more important, it actually uh, allows us to integration with other frameworks, for example, System C, uh, in a much better way. The C event is not supposed to be used by simulation models because there are just too many ways to use it in the wrong way. So we don't recommend that. <laughs> okay, in relation to the most of the, to the to the C event change, we change the scheduler. So uh, you see instead of Steam message, there is now C event. And also as a guess next event, which is only used by the user interface to, to display about the next event that's probably coming. I'm saying probably because if you are doing like hybrid simulation, events may come up from the outside world, which may overtake the, the next one. <coughs> the simulation currently knows it. Okay, and once we were there, we made the, the future event set also replaceable. Before it was uh, a hard coded class called C message heap. And uh, now there's an abstract class, future event set, and you can subclass and implement it. The, the, the interface with different data structure, uh, and then you can uh, configure it in the in the file to, to use the new class. Uh, the motivation, well, it's possibly motivation is that uh, auto and data structures can be a little bit more efficient under certain uh, certain workloads. <coughs> so, for example, skip lists, which is a kind of multi-level list. Well, balance trees or calendar queues could be experimented with, but we don't really expect much much changes. Not so large time gain from that. But the, the possibility is open nevertheless. Okay, the simulation life cycle <coughs> since that was also uh, that was pretty much missing. Now you can you can hook up on events like starting the simulation, simulation ending with the error, or simulation being paused, and so on. And uh, extension classes like a scheduler class can, can depend on, on these events to, to do various things. Fingerprint changes. I don't know how many of you use fingerprints as a regression testing tool. How many of you know fingerprints? Oh, that's, that's pretty good. That's good. <laughs> so actually, since the introduction, it, it has been proven really really useful for us. So, they, so whenever we change some things in INET, we immediately run fingerprint tests and it will bring out the, all the errors, the, the mistakes that we made. And uh, uh, we also learned that uh, this uh, fingerprint mechanism could be improved upon a little bit. So we did some changes. For example, it turned out that we used, originally we used module IDs in the fingerprint hash. But if we remove a module which it doesn't do anything otherwise, that change the fingerprint, or we swap two modules that otherwise doesn't do anything in a the simulation, then it also changed the fingerprint. So now we we change two module pass strings, and uh, actually it also turned that it would be nice to have the possibility to put more things into the fingerprint, like the uh, packet lengths, packet class existence of control information and these kind of things. So we are making it, it configurable. And also we want to um, to be able to use old fingerprints to, to check when you port model from, from this version to that version. So there's also backward compatibility mode. Okay, last year we presented the Canvas API, which is like possibly to, to add graphical elements to the OMLED display. And also we did some plug cleanup. So we removed the deprecated functions. We put everything into the OMLED PP namespace. Now it's mandatory. Uh, we did some minor things with iterators. Uh, removed some old, old uh, features that we used when porting from 3.x to 4.0 and so on. And we also did a little bit of, of cleanup on the on the source code. So we were using some C11 stuff like null pointer and override, had a file syntax. Uh, we're using nested namespaces for our internal libraries as well. Basically, 
beautify some internal names. So it's not really that's visible from the outside, but make the source code like more pleasant experience to work with. And um, with time, we'll we'll migrate to requiring C++ 11 or C++ 14 even because it provides just so much more features. But for the moment being, we didn't want to to make this step. So maybe we do it in one or two years, and we'll get feedback <coughs> from the community if someone uses compilers that are not C++ 11 compliant then then we'll, maybe we'll keep this possibility a little more. Basically that's it. And then we come to to the second part. And we hope that really we'll be able to start a, a simulation demo. <coughs> So this is a queuing network simulation using TKN. I wonder if someone realized something strange. Can you start a simulation? <laughs> yes. Okay, so this is actually isn't what it, what it looks like. It's uh, this ethic is an old technology. It's been it's been around for like 25 years, something like that. And it's not really keeping up with today's needs. So we have ported the, the runtime interface to, to Qt. So this is, this is, this is Qt Amp. We've been working it since the beginning of summer. And uh, to, to speed up migration, we have basically started from the, the TKM code base and changed it. <coughs> We've rewritten everything for Qt. It's by the same functionality, and we have a, the benefit of working with a 100-person C++ code, clean features, lots of lots of user user interface toolkit features, and we will take this from here. Okay, so this will be. Qtem will be included in the 5.0 version for testing and feedback, but not will, will not be enabled by default, but everybody can, can switch it on. And after one in the next versions, it will be the default, but we'll, we'll keep taking around in case uh, Qt isn't <coughs> available in some environment or someone needs it. Right, and we'll be adding features gradually. Okay, now another demo. <coughs> yes. So this is one thing we built into, into QTEMP, is 3D visualization. So this is just one model to, to make it uh, to demonstrate that really it's, it is possible. So how, how do we do this? This visualization is, is built up on the OpenSeam Graph Toolkit. It's an open source toolkit, which is based on, <coughs> on OpenGL, and it's used by, by a, lot of, uh, a lot of different groups for, for various purposes, visual simulation, games, virtual reality, virtual reality, scientific visualization, and so on. And it runs on all major platforms. And there are some example screenshots. <coughs> so actually, to to demonstrate how we can use uh, Open Scene Graph for three D visualization, we made a demo. Basically, a shared office space, and uh, <coughs> if we run this simulation, <laughs> <laughs> so where's the cheese? Cheese. <laughs> 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 oh, 
these are the packets which are running. <laughs> <laughs> It is a simple demo, so there's people running around on the Philippine path and so on. <laughs> they can be the impersonations of traffic. Actually, we can select also the... Yes, if you click on one of the, one of the, the people, then, then you can recompose its properties. This is a normal global left view. <laughs> Much better than you want. Much better. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's nice, but what about like terrain and, uh, and city and do these kind of things? So luckily, um, Open scene graph is very popular, and there is an extension on top of it. It's called OSG Earth, and uh, it's kind of nice. If you start it, its demo, this <coughs> looks like just like Google Earth. So you, you see the the globe. You can zoom in. You can pan, and then if you zoom in, the satellite photos get more detailed and detailed, and so on. And uh, it's very nice. It's, it can uh, use various uh, map providers and satellite image providers and elevation data providers. And uh, yeah, both online and offline. So actually, you can also download some data and package it up and not depend on the network anymore for further runs. And uh, yeah, all the display can be annotated various types of graphical objects. So you can basically draw lines and draw circles and put 3D models there. And also it includes the conversion between various geographical coordinate systems, which also mm -hmm. would come <coughs> handy. So, uh, we can use, um, use this for realizing different scenarios, like terrains, urban environments, okay, indoor environments that we have seen, and also, also satellites. And we have written some more, some more demos to, to show some of these. Oh, actually, visual visualization, yes, we want to visualize for wireless networks, the wireless, okay, wireless transmissions, the mobile nodes themselves, connectivity <coughs> graph, transmission range, okay, we know all this. And maybe some more, you'll see what the possibilities will be. So let's see some more demos. So this is actually OpenStreetMap, used as map provider. And we have been setting up a small wireless network in the park. <laughs> okay, so they are they carry some wireless devices and they, they communicate with each other <coughs> some transmissions. Are they exploding? No, not really. They are just graphical demos, but they could be cut. Yeah, I mean, physical books would be very interesting.
Okay, select models, city traffic. We have some trucks that run around on pretty fine path. Actually, on the streets. For the, for the movement, you use an existing mobility model, or what do you use for all the movements? No, well, this is just a simple <coughs> demo. Just, just a simple We use it, whatever was simplest. <laughs> Yeah, actually, it's not uh, from the INET, it's, it's a self-contained mobility yes. demo in the yeah. samples directory. Uh, it's actually just waypoint mobility. The point is that this could be also... It could be. It could be, yes. And the, the coordinates are real geographical coordinates. So they could come from <coughs> Sumo or whichever, oh, same way, yeah. yes, okay. in whichever data we satellite network. So you can see the <coughs> the connectivity between satellites and also there are some, some ground stations and it's also shown in the using the yellow lines which satellites see which ground <coughs> stations. Did you incorporate the SP4 mm -hmm. or No. Okay. This. <laughs> okay. Right. What we, we designed this, we made this demo uh, with the OSS simulator in mind that it could pretty much mm -hmm. use something, something similar. <coughs> using geostationary orbit. The local thing, obviously, like apparently originated from Munich. So, well, not, not Munich, sorry, <laughs> from Zurich. And we also found some pictures from the Boston Corporate. And quite accidentally, this is one of the demo 3D models in the OpenSim graph package. <laughs> okay, so how do, how can you do stuff like that? Basically, you need to use the OpenSync Graph API. The more works, you just assemble the OSG Scene Graph using OSG API and give it to you on a cross plus for display. And if you want animation, you can just, during the simulation, you can change the Scene Graph and it will be reflected in the display. So there is a, a class OSG Canvas for it, which, which isn't a huge class. Basically, it is just for wrapping a scene graph pointer, plus it contains some things like a different camera position and stuff like that. And uh, every compound module, actually every module does have a built-in OLG canvas, which is not instantiated if you don't use 3D, but when you call like get, get OLG canvas, it will be created and, and it will be also visible in, in the graphical environment. But you can also create additional canvases, so you can have as many 3D scenes as you want. Uh, and the viewer is built into the Unit user interface, as we have seen. Yes, and uh, well, as OpenSync Graph is an optional dependency from that, 
uh, probably it's a good idea to to surround surround your code with an if def have OSG in the code so it compiles even if OpenSync graph is not available. And there's some example code. Basically, for the very first demo, for the glider demo, let's just read the model file, and then we uh, get the OSG <coughs> canvas pointer, give it the the, the model, and, and that's it. And if you want to display the Boston scene, there's there are Earth files where you can describe what are the map provider, what are the ele is the elevation provider, and and what's the location that you want to visualize for initially. And then you just uh, put like Boston.Earth here instead of this model, and you can flip the the uh, viewer style to OSG Earth because then you will have a different kind of camera manipulator. Yes, and everything else is just standard open scene graph. So that's it. <coughs> Some additional tips here could be give the created a tech review from this. Uh, it's just running on Linux, uh, but we will put it into the testing area of the on that site tomorrow, by tomorrow. So you can try it. So. And that contains the QT part? Yes. So is OSG or because that writes on top of OSG? Yes. Is that when you have OSG, is that assume you have ERP as well? Yes, or maybe we'll split, we'll split the two dependencies and you can have OSG without OSG or with, with or yes. without <coughs> And then, like when you install and Windows, are you actually compiling the PP libraries in Windows or are you packaging them up for you? We'll probably package it. That's okay. actually that's a big. Yes, we actually have to work it out. That's that's the biggest uh, obstacle yeah. <laughs> until yeah. until 5.0 version because when we looked at it, like if we just naively package up all the, all the Qt, and the OSG is for Windows, then it's going to be a, a gigabyte download. And we don't want to do that, so we just have to figure out uh, how to, <laughs> to do it in, in less in smaller files. And also, we have to figure out OS X how to do it, because it has its own ways of things. Yeah, I have a question about the new fingerprints. Is there still the issue with uh, different fingerprints on? Uh, Depending on the processor. The depending on the processor? Yeah, I think there was an issue uh, with um, different fingerprints on AMD and Intel processors with the mm -hmm. uh, floating point accuracy or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, it, when you run the simulation in uh, Volgrind, I think, internally it used 64 bit floating points. Uh, operations, whereas normally the, the processor computes everything in 80, 80 bits and then truncates it to 64 bits. So you had this difference, and maybe also across different processors. But uh, we can't do much about that. <laughs> what we can do <coughs> is that the, uh, you can specify uh, different fingerprints and the simulation will accept any of those. So basically, what you can do is run it on both platforms and put both fingerprints into the init file, and whichever comes out, it will be accepted. Okay. Yeah, it's still a problem. We are doing a lot of continuous integration, uh -huh. uh, and so you need to run once on every platform and see where it fails, and then add all the fingerprints. But I agree, there's then no other way than. Well, there might be compiler options if you can. I convinced the compiler yeah, to do floating point operations in one way or the other way. There is a GCC, <laughs> like I think it's also in the in the readme, but um, yeah, then you have to tell it your users that it's okay that the test fails uh, mm -hmm. if the user didn't compile on that with this flag. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we'll have to in investigate this a little bit more. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so regarding the in the new QT interface, uh, what are some of the features that you're thinking about for uh, like 5.1, 5.2? 5 
and uh, is it already like available that uh, we uh, when we filter log messages is this safe now because this was a thing that's bothered me and a couple of colleagues for a couple of years that mm -hmm. you filter your log message window because uh, you just want the module output from those mm -hmm. two routers not the mm -hmm. upper modules mm -hmm. for example and mm -hmm. you restart your simulation and you have to filter again and if you have tens of thousands of modules it can mm -hmm. get quite cumbersome to mm -hmm. apply the filter all the time mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's implemented already but we are there are some missing pieces in QTEMP mm -hmm. still so there are some very rare uh, crashes sometimes or a little quirks and we have to implement these re remembering options for example there are these are things that we'll do until the release and after that so how stable is it in daily work it's already it is it is thing? stable for daily work I would <coughs> say, yes. and what kind of features you think for the next release already got some ideas uh. <laughs> uh, improving animations <laughs> now animations are just these, these red dots and it's one obvious thing that they should be like strips so when you so <coughs> when you look at the, the connection arrow you can see actually the uh, saturation of the link because if these strips connect then it's 100 percent saturated okay. and well, other kinds of animation improvement and, and we'll see uh, how do you uh prioritize your list of things to, yeah. to add to, to owner. What's your criterion of saying, you know, this we have to put mm -hmm. an ad and that can, that can wait? Is it mm -hmm. mostly input from the community or uh, yes. know, stuff you think, you know, this would be really cool or you look at other simulation tools and say, you know, do we have to add that as well to be competitive? <coughs> yes, a little bit of mix. And also like ease of implementation. Because if it's like something has a big impact and it's it's not a big work to implement, then uh, it can be done. But also, we are looking at needs of, of, of the community. So, what exactly would you uh, want from the community? Uh, like, um, should we try to give regular feedback, some uh, some questionnaire system, anything that will help you uh, point out what's more important to do, yeah, to implement, and for us, like, what are the most wanted features? Mm -hmm. Is that Anything that the community can actually help in this case? Yes, yes. We are also thinking about like putting together some questionnaire, but of course, like live discussions are more, uh, they are better, definitely better. So once we are here, I think that's that's a great opportunity to to tell uh, what's missing or what could be could be improved. Like another thing is that, for example, one example feature that we are thinking about is that. Okay, Omnet is mostly used for, for protocol simulations, right? So it could be, it would probably make sense to build in some kind of protocol analyzer feature. So like if INET has uh, um, packet serializers, which would put, uh, to, to create packets, then some kind of, it would be uh, useful to, to be able to look at, the, look at the packets that have been sent in the network and look at their contents and so on. I think that would be used by quite a lot of people. It's just one random idea. Yes? Okay, you talked about uh, random number as classes. Mm -hmm. uh, does, is uh, any c every class is using a, a different stream? As a source source for a random number, or are you th are they taking from the same pool? Actually, they, these these objects they take the random numbers. They take a pointer to a random number generator. Okay. So you can give them Whichever. either separate separate instances to each of them, or the same instance to all of them. Mm -hmm. or okay. They maintain the want. same flexibility that was in uh, mm -hmm. already in. Uh, like yes. One more question. Do you see a chance that um, it is possible to, to um, have more feedback on what you are currently working on? So that we are seeing uh, once a year. So for the time in between, that uh, is, would it be possible to, to just somehow similar to, to INET to have a development version mm -hmm. for the the people who are really interested in the new features? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we should always strive to 
to create more intermediate versions like alpha versions and beta version. Uh, and then you can see more what's what what is coming. And also it would give more more room for improvement because okay now, nowadays we also have these these files feature files of what what we plan for the next release, what we plan for the release afterwards and after and after. And uh, the effect of life is that it's uh, it's very hard to guess how much time each feature will <laughs> will take to implement and also also fact of life there's some other things coming in between that also have to be tackled so it's it's really difficult to judge how much will fit into the uh, into the next version so our uh, experience is that we always a little, little bit over overestimate our capabilities <laughs> <laughs> one we have a, a plan for the next release and, and like probably like half of it will actually be implemented um, obviously the, the, the most most important half the most most urgent half but per perhaps that's also not a problem in, in itself because then uh, after about half a year or one year passes then you see maybe you see the features that you originally planned that you see them in a different light and maybe you see that okay they were not so important after all and there are other features may pop up that are really actually more important so my idea was that we may get more feedback mm -hmm. from people using features and yeah, you, you mm -hmm. get the feedback at a point in time where it's possible to make changes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think with betas, it's a bit late to make changes then. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's there are already some people adjusting their models based on, on, on the betas, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a double-edged sword, though. Yeah. It's just going to say you have to protect yourself a little bit. You know, there's sure, people yeah. in this in this room that kind of know what they're doing. But if you make those versions publicly available, you're going to probably be inundated with questions from people who don't understand what, what's really going on and you know, yeah, the thing flood is you with. The thing is actually that we are working on a separate uh, uh, features in the topic branches. So they are actually not even public for the other. Uh, I mean, we can uh, check the other uh, guys' work, but uh, we are working separately. So actually, we are in integrating into the main branch when it is more or less done. Otherwise, we cannot revert. So there, there happened seven, uh, several times that we thought something was cool, and then we just reverted it halfway or almost totally. So it's a bit bit hard, like you put something out and then you decide that, oh, people start using it and then for some technical reason you decide that you cannot really put it into the version or it's not visible at all and then you have to remove that and explain why you did that. So putting out hardware software, I wouldn't do that, probably it would be good to communicate the plans better. Like uh, we did with Qt. But the thing is that Qt was quite fast. So we, was we didn't fast. expect this. So this was a surprise because we started it in the... You can tell that, Andres, that we, we tried several yes. TK and variants. Yes, we had uh, we had a few trials at an replacing yeah, tickle TK. So the first one was uh, a Java-based runtime environment based on the on the Eclipse UI toolkit SWT, and that would be like like Qt and TK. And that would be a library that you link against, and then when you start the simulation, it will would load the, the Java library and pop up the, the UI, and I implemented quite a fair chunk of it when it just turned out that the configuration was actually very, very fragile. So whenever something it went wrong, it just couldn't find the, the Java jar files. And so it was very, very <coughs> fragile. So we just forgot it. And then the second attempt was that we would build a, a, like a simulation viewer feature into the IDE. 
It's like, it, it would be like a debugger. So you, you start a simulation, it would run in the background as a command line process, and, and the IDE would connect into the simulator using a socket, and then it would display the objects and it then display the animation and, and everything. And then um, we also stopped that because I, I wasn't sure about the, the scalability. So when it came, when we tried it on really large simulations, there were huge HTTP requests, and the whole thing was very sluggish. So and also when <coughs> the simulation crashes, you don't get any feedback. It just the UI says it cannot talk to the process anymore, and you don't know what happened. <laughs> <coughs> So basically, we abandoned that as well, and then we started QTAM, but we didn't expect to go it very smoothly because we ju we just hired uh, some students from the university and and gave him the task, and it went surprisingly well. And there was another very competent student. They did it basically like three and three four months, but the the key was actually that we said. We don't want any invention, any new invention, any new UI features at this time. Do exactly what TKM does, exactly that. And we also took the TKM code base, we just copied it and uh, replaced the, the tickle calls, the tickle C API with dummy functions. So actually, when we started it, it just popped up an empty window and didn't do anything, but almost all the code to run the simulation actually the, the TKM logic was was in there, and then those guys started, and then they used Qt Creator to to draw the, the windows and put together dialogues and connect it to the existing piece of C++ code, and the whole thing came like like really surprisingly well. So I didn't really expect, and then the two to happen, and we then we <coughs> got a hint from from someone. That about OS the open scene graph, and also we first it was a long time long time plan to integrate 3D visualization, and then we looked at looked at demos, and we said oh, the API was surprisingly friendly and, and it was a very capable library and so on, and uh, incidentally we also found uh, a, a QT a QT uh, uh, open scene graph integration package. So I just hacked, started hacking, and like in one hour I got a window, which is a, which was a cute window and some OSG demo in it. So I thought, okay, if that's so simple, then okay, we can take that two weeks and <laughs> put it into cute then, because like why not? Yeah, so th things go like that. Actually, QTM was not planned for five to two. Yeah, it was not yes. planned. It was <laughs> planned for something later, exactly, but yes. it just. <laughs> got ready sooner than expected. What uh, version of Qt is it? Is that working with? Uh, currently, we're depending on Qt four. On four. Okay. Yes, because because uh, <coughs> this open scene graph integration package it it yeah. it somehow it compiled with Qt five, but it crashed. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay. I mean, we still have. No, a couple of a couple of minutes uh, left. We can shorten the break a little bit. So, if anybody uh, still has some burning desire for new Omnet <laughs> features, then I think this is the time to speak up. <laughs> so maybe not a desire for a new feature, but to uh, come back to Till's question. Uh, maybe there is a way to connect uh, the developer at Omnet that specifically thinks about a new feature a bit faster with the community and get their feedback even mm -hmm. before you have. Uh, plan it all out and implement it and then mm. find out it's useful or not useful. If there's some kind of like, I don't know, like developer uh, blog or anything like this where mm. you can just post a short message, okay, I'm just thinking about this and that feature and uh, somebody in the community that might read this like Till and oh, that's, that's a good feature. Uh, I would like to uh, see that. <coughs> so you can get a direct feedback, more direct feedback than you have at the moment. I mean, mm -hmm. the main problem is we see once a year, maybe we write some mails and but uh, there are usually people that either don't come to the summit or they wouldn't write you a direct mail, but they have some good ideas about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. and that might be another option just to steer interest in the community and mm -hmm. grab faster feedback. I think it's similar to what we discussed uh, over mail, um, some basic usage statistics. 
that you are probably interested in. Mm -hmm. so how many people are using Omnet, which model, which version, and under which operating system? Mm -hmm. Just have uh, some knowledge of how long to support certain platforms, how long to support compilers. And I can guess that this is quite cumbersome to support all these older releases, older compilers when you want to switch to C14, mm -hmm. C14, or want to move away from all the compiler support. So. I guess things that the community are interested in, things that you're interested in, uh, mm -hmm. there are probably certain ways that we can connect. Yes. Yeah, maybe we need uh, this one once a year, just isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, studio conference, mm -hmm. Skype, or uh, conference. Actually, there are some other ways that we try. Uh, um, new things, for example, in, in INET. INET is, is more open in development, and also we, we roll out releases more often. So um, sometimes it happens that if there is some some uh, improvement in Omnet, but it, which could be implemented also separate from Omnet, but in, for example, in INET, we put it into INET. For example, there was this complaint that project features could only be enabled and disabled from the IDE. And uh, we wrote a, a Python script like a few months back that could do the same from the command line. So you can command line, you can specify which features to turn on, which features to turn off, get the generated make make command and so on. And uh, I thought, okay, if we put it into Omnet, then it will take ages before it reaches users. So we put it into INET. Now there's an, this feature to this part of uh, INET can be tried out. Or we did the same thing with the uh, C topology class. We needed some extensions. And OK, well, Omnet has a longer release cycle. So we just copied the C topology, extended it, put into some into it some methods, and it became part of Inet for a while. The main problem I see at the moment is that those new features, you tend to stumble upon them when you read the release notes. But uh, I don't know how many people like outside this room read those and release notes. Probably not many. Mm -hmm. Then even when they read them, they try to misunderstand them or they don't even mm -hmm. think about that this is a cool new feature. Mm -hmm. I think we had this discussion of uh, the uh, command line tool with the binet features on the mailing list and you posted it there and uh, well, afterwards it got some attention. You posted it uh, in the release uh, notes a couple of months even back. No one ever mentioned it and no one ever thought about it. Mm -hmm. And as soon as there was some other node, and people, you know, people started using it afterwards. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, carry some marketing stuff for <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably, yeah. Yes. 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 Because most of the new ideas are pretty, pretty amazing what you show here, and even the things that were done in between INET two and INET three. Lots of big improvements, but uh, yeah, yes. so that we like open and loud about them. The principal problem is that uh, that uh, people in in our group they like to program, but not so much like writing blogs <laughs> and stuff. Like that. No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I think we can have a seven-minute break and a <coughs> quarter to. Um, we start with uh, Antonio's tutorial, which will be the. Not quite the final part of the program, but the, part of the final part of the technical program, and then we can proceed to the food. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you.